in Acts, a very appropriate passage to celebrate the work of the gospel in our church. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Somewhat of a, a lengthy passage this morning. We're going to be looking at Acts 10 through uh, the middle part of, of chapter 11. So I'm going to read it in three sections. And then we'll jump in, comment on each section briefly. And then I'm going to take the latter part of the message to apply it to our church in this moment and the life of our church. But before I jump into reading, I, I wanted to just seize the moment to say how much your pastors love and are grateful for you. Um, it's really our privilege to say this as often as we can. Uh, we don't serve this church pastorally because it's a job and you got to do something. Um, we don't uh, serve this church merely as people that are in chairs. Uh, we love you. You are our brothers and sisters in Christ. It would be our joy. I know I speak for Aaron and Bart as well when I say this. It, it would be our joy to be members with you regardless of the ways that we serve. Uh, but it is especially a joy to have the privilege of pastoring you, of having a front row seat of God's grace at work in your life, your love for each other, your perseverance through trial, your joy in the gospel, your study of God's word, your care for each other. I don't know if there's anything we enjoy more than hearing some new report of how God is at work. Oftentimes when we have our pastoral meetings, one or the other of us will comment on some new evidence of God's grace in one of you. And there's just nothing more enjoyable in those meetings than that, uh, than hearing this person is growing, or this person served, or this person is enduring trial, or we see this growth in this small group fellowship. Those kind of moments are highlight moments for us. We love you. We are grateful for you. We respect you. It's a joy to be seeing God build his church together. So receive that on this anniversary. Receive our affection for you as pastors. Well, let's read. Let's read just the first of three parts in this lengthy section, and then we'll, we'll begin to dive into the explanation of it. Chapter 10, the book of Acts. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? 
And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. My wife and I both enjoy old movies. And one of the old movies that we have enjoyed a number of times with our children is called The Happiest Millionaire. It is a ridiculous movie. So I'm not commending it because you'll just mock my intelligence if you watch it. Um, it is a ridiculous movie, but we love it because it's funny and goofy and silly. And it's all about this millionaire family who is as eccentric as they come and likes having Bible studies in his backyard and boxing and having alligators in the house. And this is the movie that we watch. Well, in the course of the movie, his daughter, who he loves and cherishes, meets a young man and they decide they want to get married. Well, Mr. Biddle doesn't like the young man. And frankly, he wouldn't like any young man who came looking for his daughter because no one is good enough. He doesn't like the young man, but he really, really doesn't like the young man's family because they are condescending and they are, he thinks, unworthy of being around his daughter and his family. He doesn't like them. He's annoyed by them. He's offended by their airs that they put on. He doesn't like them at all. And so the movie progresses and there's this tension between these two families as the wedding plans progress. Well, at one point, as the movie reaches its climactic moments, the mother of the groom comes into the house and is wanting to know why the invitations for her family has not been delivered. And she is very upset. And they have this whole silly argument where they sing to each other and it's typical Disney fare. And then the butler for Mr. Biddle decides, well, let's go, what could have happened? And so he's going and looking and searching, and he comes back at just the wrong and hilarious moment to say, oh, here they are. They were lost under the boxes we're donating of the clothes. The invitations to the in-laws, they were lost under the donation box. And everybody stands for a moment, and there's this awkward silence because that's not really where you want to put the invitations to your in-laws to the wedding. And that just proves the lady's point. You don't really want us at this wedding. And as watchers of the movie, you have to say, yeah, he really doesn't. Maybe he didn't mean to put them there, but he didn't mean not to either. He really doesn't want them there. He really doesn't like them. Maybe he wouldn't say it in so many words, or maybe he wouldn't intentionally burn the invitation, but he doesn't really want them there. He doesn't really want to invite them into this wedding, and more importantly, he doesn't really want to invite them into his life. Let's ask a question. How welcoming is God? Is God like Mr. Biddle? Certain people, he just doesn't really want them there. He might not say it quite that way, but deep down, we all know the kind of people he's talking about. He doesn't really want them there. And maybe he didn't not send an invitation, but it conveniently got lost in the donation category. It conveniently got discarded. It conveniently got overlooked. How welcoming is God? And be careful before we answer, because what we think about God, it changes us. It sets a standard for us. It shapes us. How welcoming is God? This passage answers the question, but every time we come to God's word, we have to come carefully because how we answer that question with every passage of scripture, it sets something before us that has the potential to transform our lives, to change the way we think. How welcoming is God and how welcoming are we? This opening section, I might caption the initiative, the initiative, because there's an event that's going to take place in the second part of this section. There's a serious event that's going to happen, but this opening section is all about God initiating the event. I think the main thing we're supposed to take away <laughs> from these opening scenes is the profoundly supernatural nature of God's initiative. Again, don't, don't get caught up in the details and be looking for theology right away. Just enjoy the story and you'll get the main point. And if you just enjoy the story, you almost have to smile and 
chuckle at the overwhelming, obviously supernatural nature of these initiatives. First, there's this man, Cornelius. He is a faithful, devout man, God-fearing, so somewhat connected to the Jewish religion. We don't know if he was a full convert or just a faithful kind of God-fearing Gentile, but at some level, he has a good reputation. He's praying, and he sees an angel, no less than an angel of God, comes to him and communicates to him that he's to go to a specific city looking for a man with a specific name. He even knows his nickname. And then he says he's staying with a man who has this name. Very specific supernatural instructions. Cornelius, go to this city, look for this man. He has this nickname and talk to him. He's staying at the house of this man who has this trade. The point being, you cannot mess up these instructions. Even if you're me and you're a terrible driver and I'm going to have to use my phone to get to the park this afternoon because I won't make it there any other way. Uh, Even if you're me, you can't mess up these instructions. This is the city. This is the guy. This is his name. And this is his nickname. And here's what he does for a living. There's this supernatural sense. And you notice, you notice that the writer, Luke, he weaves in the coordinated effort going on here. So you look down at verse 9. As these servants of Cornelius are traveling to Joppa, right before they get there, Peter gets hungry. He goes up on the roof to pray, and he's waiting for a meal to be prepared. And all of a sudden, he has a trance. So you're supposed to feel the drama of this. These three messengers from Cornelius are making their way. They're almost there from Caesarea to Joppa, a long journey, and they're almost there. And just before they reach the door of this Jewish apostle, he has a trance on a roof. And in the trance, he sees this sheet coming down. It's filled with all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. Now, we live in Texas. We are not first century Jews. We might not get why this is a big deal. But for them, there's animals included here which Jews were forbidden to eat. All right, that's why Peter uh, is shocked and reluctant. They're forbidden to eat because the food laws of the Old Testament were one practical way of God distinguishing Israel from the rest of the nations. This is my people. How do we know? You eat this way. Don't eat that way. And that's how we'll distinguish you from the rest of the nations. You are my special people. You are my chosen possession. You, the children of Abraham, and you should distinguish yourself by a number of ways. And one of them is don't eat this. Always eat this. And we'll show you the moral categories of clean and unclean by a practical symbolism of eating this and not eating this. We'll call these foods unclean. We'll call these foods clean. And that will help you understand that there are clean and unclean ultimately in categories of God and humanity. And so that's the background of the passage. And so when this heavenly voice says, rise, Peter, kill and eat, he says, surely not, Lord. Surely not. How how can you be telling me to uh, defile myself by going and taking in that which you've said I should not take in? How can I welcome as it is into my body that which you have declared off limits for me? And then the answer comes, God has made something clean, therefore no longer call it common. So we begin to get the anticipation of the passage. God is doing something unique here. An era is ending and an era is beginning. What God has called clean, no longer call common, Peter. If God has declared these foods now clean for you, you are no longer allowed to restrain yourself from pursuing them. You are no longer allowed to call unclean what God has decided shall be called clean. So this is the authoritative God ruling over the eras of his dispensation to his people and declaring, now is a new day, Peter. And you notice the repetition because uh, obviously Peter, like any faithful Jew, would assume this has got to be wrong. This cannot be right. So God repeats it three times. Notice that? Three times. This happened three times in verse 16. And then the thing was taken up all at once to heaven. Unless Peter could even remotely forget about this or it would lose traction in his mind, as he's thinking about this vision, as he's thinking about it, the men come to the gate and are calling out to ask, where is Simon who is called Peter? 
And Peter is simultaneously, verse 19, pondering the vision, and the Spirit says to him supernaturally, Behold, three men are looking for you. And notice the same word, rise and go down and accompany them. So the the whole point of this prelude is to say God is acting. Cornelius is praying. He has no idea he's supposed to call on Jesus as Savior. He does not know Peter. Peter is praying, and God begins to move. God begins to move. He tells Cornelius, you need what Peter uh, can tell you. And so send to Joppa for Peter. Peter, you have a job to do because a new era is beginning and I want to prepare you for it. Do not call common what God has made clean. And there's people at the door and you are supposed to go with them. There's this sense of divine initiative, divine action, divine prerogative. God is about to do something. God is on the move. God is going before Peter. God is acting towards Cornelius. That's the point of this passage. We should read it and feel like God is moving. God is about to do something. There's a certain electricity in the air. God coordinated it. He told Cornelius and he waited the day for the messengers to get there so that they could literally be knocking at the gate while Peter is trying to figure out what in the world that vision meant practically. And then the spirit says to him the same kind of phrase, rise and go down. Rise and eat these unclean animals previously that God has called clean. Now, what does that mean? Rise and go down with these Gentiles and accompany them. Incredible prelude, all about God's initiative. And if I can make a point of application for us right here, God is the one who initiates every action in the building of his church. God is the mover. God moves first, and then we move. God acts, and we respond. God is acting to build his church in this chapter, Acts chapter 10. And and we should rejoice in that and and take great comfort in that. God is able to coordinate various activities across different cities. And before we know it, we're caught up in his action. God is acting. It is God's initiative. How welcoming is God? Well, here, God is taking the action towards his apostle And this man, Cornelius, and he takes the action to bring them together. The invitation has begun. The initiative, first section. Second section, the event. Look down there at the second half of verse 23. The next day, he, Peter, rose and went away with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power 
power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus, Christ, and then they asked him to remain for some days. The event. The event. This is one of the key events in the book of Acts. If you remember from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said to his disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The sovereign Lord is breaking in to the Gentile world. That's the event that's taking place here. That's the main event. He initiated it with Cornelius and Peter. He brought them together. He removed the legal barrier of Jews associating with Gentiles. He commanded Peter to go, and he says the message of the gospel in front of these people, and they receive the word. The Holy Spirit falls on them. They begin to speak in other tongues, just as the disciples did at Pentecost, and Peter and the Jerusalem brothers are amazed. They say, is, is it possible God, the God of our fathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God has fallen on these Gentiles. The nations, for a Jewish son of Abraham, the nations represented those that hated God, that rejected God, that worshipped all kinds of demons and idols that had nothing to do with Yahweh. And I think if you're wondering why Cornelius is referenced so many times as being a God-fearing man and a godly Gentile, and he was obviously had some knowledge of Yahweh and attempted to follow God, I think probably a major reason that is is because God was making it as easy as possible for Peter and his Jewish brothers to take this step. This was a massive, massive step. It was a new era in salvation history. It was a total change from everything they'd been told before. Before, to associate with Gentiles was to reject God. Now, to be with God was to go to the Gentiles. That was a major change. Before, to associate with Gentiles was to reject God. Now, to be with God was to go to the Gentiles. And I think God chose this God-fearing Gentile just to make it a little easier. At, at least he's not a a wicked, despicable pagan. At, at, least, at least he's a God-fearing man, and it may be a little easier. You can feel the, the awkwardness. I think you can almost sense it in Peter's speech. <laughs> you yourselves know <laughs> that we don't do this. And I think that's why he brought six other guys with him, because he wanted a lot of witnesses. Look, I, I have all these brothers with me, and here we come into this room, and I'm not doing anything other than saying the gospel. I'm not touching anything. No, ma'am, I don't want that food. I, uh, yeah, and yes, let's talk. Why did you send me? You sense the awkwardness because the era is changing. The era of distinctions is changing. School is out. The summer has begun. The law in its commandment to prepare the people for the day of Christ has now given way to the graduation when the nations will see the Savior. And Peter is understandably reluctant and nervous. 
But then he begins to preach, and as he proclaims the good news, do you know about, about Jesus? And he tells the message. Jesus was attested of having divine power was with him. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. He overcame demons, he said. But then they crucified him. He hung on a tree, but God raised him up. And let me tell you who he is. He is God's Savior for judgment and salvation for the forgiveness of sins to anyone who believes in him. And this Jewish fisherman proclaims it, and while he is still preaching, imagine this, imagine he's in this room, he's preaching, and he says, Jesus is the Savior of the world, and in him there is forgiveness for sinners, and as he's preaching, people begin to be undone by the power of the Spirit. They begin to speak out in other tongues, extolling God for this great salvation, and Peter stops speaking, and he's watching, and he can't believe what's happening. Revival breaks out in Cornelius' house. The Gentiles encounter Yahweh indwelling them and overpowering them at the name of Jesus Christ. The event has taken place. The progression from Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria with Philip and the eunuch, and you remember that, has now broken into the Gentile world. At the confession of Jesus Christ, this Jewish apostle now discovers that God has declared the invitation of the gospel available to all, of every nation, of every tribe, of every language, of every background. A Roman soldier can experience the indwelling of the Spirit of God and can claim the name of Jesus as his Savior. In Peter's mind, that meant... There is no distinction in the welcome of God to the gospel. There is no other category left. If a Gentile soldier, Roman, the oppressor of Israel, if he can claim Jesus as the Messiah, well, there are no distinctions left. Then these invitations go to everybody, to anybody. Anybody can claim Jesus as the Messiah. That's the point here. That's the point. How welcoming is God? He invites anybody. He invites anybody. That's what Peter, that's why they're so amazed. Anybody? And they don't even have to come to us. Like, we can go to them. Anybody. Anybody. Anybody? Yes, God says. See these Gentile believers speaking in tongues? You see them claiming the name of Jesus? Anybody, anybody can claim the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, believe in him as Lord and Savior. Anyone can claim that name and be saved. Anyone, Peter. Anyone, anyone, anyone. How welcoming is God? This welcoming, globally welcoming, welcoming to anyone who will claim the name of Jesus as Savior. There is a gospel for all without distinction. It does not mean all will be saved. It means there is no category of person that is automatically excluded from the invitation of the gospel. There's no type of person that is automatically excluded from the invitation of the gospel. That's the event. That's what this event is saying. The gospel is now trumpeted to all nations and any without distinction may respond. That's the event. Then finally, the confirmation. The confirmation. Let's read chapter 11, verse 1. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Now, the circumcision party will come up later in Acts. They were those who were very determined to retain a number of the Jewish practices, to retain those and not to lose those practices. They did not want to see this new movement towards Jesus move them away from certain Old Testament practices. And they'll be dealt with later on in the book of Acts as well. But in this case, the circumcision party, part of the church, brothers and sisters in the church, they criticized Peter saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Loaded religious question. Peter, you are dabbling with the enemy. Are you a faithful Jew or not? Do you believe in Yahweh or not? Are you abandoning the God of our fathers or not? 
Don't you remember what happened when we came across the wilderness and Balaam tempted us and we dabbled with those, those Gentile ladies and that turned into a debacle for the people were slaughtered and then all throughout the years we embraced the idolatry of the nations and then God judged us and sent us into exile. Peter, are you one of those kinds of Jews? Verse 4, but Peter began and explained to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying. And in a trance, I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. Just, just a quick comment. Repetition communicates importance. In narrative, repetition communicates importance. Obviously, the scroll writers didn't use 19-point font, okay? They didn't use it. What they did is they used repetition. So you notice, how many times has this been repeated now in this story? It happened to Peter. It then had said it happened three times to Peter. Then Peter says to the you know, gathering of Cornelius' house, I've been told not to make any distinction. Then you see the revival happens. They're criticizing him. He tells the same exact story again. This repetition is not because Luke thinks we forgot like what happened last page. All right. He didn't repeat it because he's like, well, they turned the page and the short attention span. Oh, let's say again what happened. No, the repetition is to make the point. This is how important this is. This is how important this is. I'm going to say it. I'm going to repeat it. I'm going to repeat it again. That's why he's saying this. The voice, verse 9, answered a second time from heaven, says Peter. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were and sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me. Good move, Peter. Lots of witnesses. And we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa. I mean, oh, you got to love the humor of the scriptures. So you have this party of circumcision people. They're just there. I mean, I picture them kind of angry, hands on their hips. Peter, Peter, this is a really bad example for the people in Jerusalem. And you cannot be doing this. You are messing things up for us. And he just begins to unload the divine initiatives point after point. Okay, so I had a divine vision. And then the spirit told me directly to go with them. At that moment, the people were at the house. And then we went into their house. And he told me how an angel told him to send for me. And then I came and he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your house. And then listen to this, brothers. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then, here's conclusion, God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then how welcoming is God to the Gentiles also. God has granted repentance that leads to life. How welcoming is your God? Why does he say it again and again and again? He wants to make it very clear. This gospel goes to all without distinction. There is no background, culturally, religiously, ethnically, racially, that excludes you from receiving an invitation to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, to claim him as the Lord of the living and the judge of those who will rule over those when they rise from the dead. This is the gospel invitation. It goes to all without distinction. God speaks supernaturally into his church. 
primarily made up of Jewish believers, and he says, the doors are now open. All who will may come. All who claim the name of Jesus may come. There is no more distinction. The school days are over. The celebration has begun. Welcome in all who would have their sins forgiven. And church, don't you dare draw a distinction where God has drawn none. the point of this story. Don't you feel that point as you read the passage? Again, all, all we're doing on Sunday morning is just talking about the Bible. What's the point? God has opened the doors of salvation. Any who will repent and believe in Jesus may claim him as Savior. And the church is to celebrate and love and rejoice that God has drawn no preconditions, no preconditions for claiming Jesus. No preconditions. No preconditions of race. No preconditions of background. No preconditions of association. No precondition of ethnicity or cultural. No preconditions. You can just receive him as Savior. Your sins are forgiven and you are heirs of eternal life like the rest of the church. God has offered the gospel freely to all without distinction. And so must we. So must we. And to conclude, let me just offer a couple of applications for our church. What does this mean? This welcome of God this welcome of God, God doesn't, God doesn't lose the invitations to the gospel to certain people. No, he makes sure they get them. Cornelius, I've got an invitation for you. Send to Joppa. Peter, don't you dare say no to these men. Go with them, preach the gospel about Jesus, and I will show you the invitation I want to give them. God doesn't lose the invitations. They're not lost in some donation bin. No, he makes sure they get where they need to go. He makes sure that the invitation is given to all without distinction. God is a welcoming God. He welcomes those from every culture, nation, and background into the fellowship of his son. All right, two applications. What does this mean for us? First of all, First of all, treasure the invitation that came to you. Treasure the invitation that came to you. When we read this story, it is good to remember that we were the unclean and that God brought the gospel to us. I, I don't think there's anybody here. If you are, you can come up and correct me. Anybody here that is a full-blooded, faithful Torah-following Jew And even if you are, you don't live in the first century. Most of us, probably all of us, are the Gentiles that were excluded from hope, without hope and without God. Now, you might have been like Cornelius, praying your head off, but unless God invited you to know Jesus as Savior, you are no better off than anybody else. You and me, we are the unclean, the unworthy, the outsiders. We are those that any reasonable person would have said <laughs> should be off the guest list. And if you're like me, even if you've been a Christian a long time, you can look at the last 48 hours and see evidence of what you would be like if God hadn't saved you. I think about this all the time. If I'm this way and I'm saved by the grace of God and know the glory of God and I still see these kind of tendencies in my soul, what in the world kind of unclean disaster would I be like if I didn't know God and I wasn't restrained by his word? And that makes me think, that's what God saw, and he invited me anyway. He sent the gospel to me in my unclean unworthiness and said, make sure that guy gets to this wedding. We have to treasure, brothers and sisters, we have to treasure the 
gospel invitation that came to us. We have to treasure it. It quickly becomes a dusty, forgotten memory that is somewhere in the attic, but I haven't looked at it recently. Doesn't it quickly become that to you? It does to me. I, I think about being a Christian and coming to church and saying, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, hallelujah, I'm saved. And it, it's comforting at some level, but it's, it's not a miracle to me in, in the fresh way I think it was for Cornelius. And you gotta love Cornelius. I mean, he doesn't know everything. He's ignorant. He starts worshiping Peter. But you gotta appreciate at some level his enthusiasm, don't you? I mean, he doesn't get it. He thinks Peter, well, God, the angel told me to go to Peter. He must be the guy. And he falls down in this dignified, officer of the Roman army. He falls down and begins to worship just the messenger. He's so excited. Oh, God is moving. And Peter says, don't do that. I'm just a fisherman. Don't worship me. But the, the sense of just excitement and enthusiasm and electricity that he had, I, I, I'm envious of that. I want that to be true of me. Peter says, oh my, look, look at what God is doing. Look at these Gentiles. They're being delivered. They're being saved. Brothers and sisters, we have to treasure the invitation that came to us. Is, is the gospel invitation, the, the welcome of you into union with Christ, how, how recently have you been treasuring it? How recently have you been treasuring? How recently have you, have you opened up to a section of the scriptures and read some passage that talks about the grace of God and just allowed yourself to be surprised again? How recently have you, you opened up to Romans 8 where it says there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus and just allowed yourself to be surprised again? I was the unclean and he sent an invitation to me. And I haven't done anything post-conversion to make that seem reasonable. Because there's still all kinds of sin, and I still seek out all kinds of other things besides God. And, and why that invitation came to me so that I would be at that wedding still doesn't make any sense from a divine perspective. But he didn't make any distinction, and that's good news because I would have been a good distinction to make. And if we don't feel like we would have been a good distinction to make, we won't be as excited as Cornelius was when Peter walked through his door. If you're feeling tired in the worship of your Savior, let's return to the moment in our minds where Cornelius has no knowledge of Jesus and no right to claim him as Messiah. But God decided to make no distinction, and he made no distinction with you and me. Charles Spurgeon says, grace is the free favor of God, the undeserved bounty of the ever gracious creator against whom we have offended. The generous pardon, the infinite, spontaneous, loving kindness of the God who has been provoked and angered by our sin, but who, delighting in mercy and grieving to smite the creatures whom he has made, is ever ready, is ever ready to pass by transgression, iniquity, and sin, and to save his people from all the evil consequences of their guilt. Brothers and sisters, we have committed more acts of uncleanness this weekend than should be allowed anywhere near the throne room of God. Yet when we came in this morning, by faith, we were at the throne room of God. The only explanation for that is that God has given mercy without distinction through the salvation of Jesus Christ. Treasure God's invitation to us. Last application briefly. Give God's invitation to others without distinction. Give it to others without distinction. Our church must reflect God's welcome without distinction. Without distinction. 
That's part of the reason we're doing the book of Acts, because it is so easy. Once your church reaches a certain comfortable size, it's so easy. Your church uh, is a comfortable family, and you have a full schedule. It's so easy to begin drawing distinctions in who you invite to hear the good news of the gospel on a Sunday, or who you share that with personally. It's so easy to begin drawing distinctions. Well, they seem like they would be a great fit, so let's invite them. I could really see them in my small group. Let's invite them. They seem like they'd be a great addition to our church family. No, we must not do that. We can't lose certain invitations in the donation bin and conveniently forget them. We must be as generous as God is with his own invitations. We can't be like Mr. Biddle who happened to neglect and forget about this box of invitations because he draws a distinction with these types of people. No, we must not be that way. Let there be no one that we would say of them what Peter said to the Lord. Oh, oh, surely not, Lord. Let there be no one in the surely not category of our life. No one in the surely not category of our life. No one in the surely not category of my life. Let us offer it generously without distinction. And, and I know this is, this is so difficult because sometimes our distinctions are way less worthy than Peter. Peter at least had, had legal background and law background and Jewish background to back him. Sometimes I just have, I don't have the time distinction. I was sitting at a soccer practice today, this week, with my kids, and they're sitting five feet from me. There's another dad cheering his son on, and I just, everything in me, I just wanted to watch my sons and video them and not talk to him. The only distinction was, he's going to take time. That's not anywhere close to what Peter has dealing with. <laughs> that was the only distinction. But I'm thinking, I, I mean, here I am in the middle of this passage, I'm studying, and I just heard last week a wonderful message about Jesus with the woman at the well, and I'm thinking, no, I, I, you have to take these steps. And so I thought, okay, what? let me introduce myself. So I introduced myself. And even that took this effort of, no, I, I don't want to do this. I'm feeling like I just want to focus on myself right now and my sons. But no, I can, I, I can introduce myself, and that might lead to another conversation. I'm probably going to be with this guy every week for the rest of the soccer season. So let me reach out to him, extend my hand. Hi, nice to meet you. And then the game was Saturday. I had another opportunity, another temptation just to say, let's just get to the car, kids. Time for lunch. But no, I thought, no, here's... <laughs> Here's this other dad. Let me introduce myself and start establishing a rapport. That's pathetic that that kind of distinction is on my mind. Well, man, I mean, really, a whole minute of conversation is just too much of a bird. Lord, surely not, Lord. A whole minute, Lord? Really, Lord? Peter at least had the Gentiles to deal with. I just have, like, I want my minutes. Brothers and sisters, we must not draw distinctions. And worse than that, lifestyle distinctions. May there be no lifestyle distinctions in the invitation of the gospel that we extend to people. May there be no socioeconomic distinctions in the way we offer the gospel to people. May there be no cultural background distinctions in the way we offer the gospel to people. May, may there be no burdensome relationship distinctions. That person's going to take a lot of work. In the way we offer the gospel to people. May, may there be no, this is the ornery, foul-mouthed dude at work distinctions in the way we offer the gospel to people. May there be no, I've shared the gospel with my dad 900 times, distinctions. May there be no distinctions. If the Gentiles are included, there can be no distinctions. May there, may there be no sin pattern distinctions. May there be no hesitation to share the gospel to those in homosexual lifestyle, lesbian lifestyle, those pursuing transgenderism. May, may there be no lifestyle distinctions in our willingness to share the gospel, to extend our hand and build that contact with someone. No distinctions of people who watch crude videos on the internet and people who laugh at foolish jokes. May there be no distinctions of those who love their wealth or who are needy because they don't have wealth, may there be no distinctions. Because God has stacks and stacks and stacks of invitations. And we don't know who will receive them or not, but we know there is no distinctions in who they go to. 
Let's treasure the God who welcomed you and me and didn't make a distinction because we weren't a big asset to his kingdom. And let's transfer that invitation to others without distinction as well. It's a good thing to remember on our fourth anniversary. When you start a church, you're all about the foundations of the gospel and the importance of reaching people and extending this invitation. And it's easy. It's easy to become distracted by the establishment nature of the church. We need fresh treasuring and we need fresh transferring because God has not stopped welcoming people into the kingdom of his son. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for welcoming us, welcoming me without distinction. Lord, I was no bonus to your kingdom, but you welcome me. Lord, help us to welcome others. Lord, thank you for that day when Cornelius saw you as Savior by faith and was filled by your spirit. Lord, I see myself in him. You were thinking of us when you sent that angel to talk to Cornelius that day. You were thinking of me when you showed Peter that vision of all those unclean animals. Lord, you were thinking of us, unclean people that needed to hear the invitation to be cleansed of their sin. You were thinking of us, Lord. So we celebrate that. We declare because of that, Lord, this anniversary and every anniversary, it is just a celebration of your undeserved grace, your grace, your favor, your initiative. The event is all about you, Lord. Receive the glory, Lord. Receive the glory on this anniversary and everyone going forward. You are the God of all grace, the God of salvation, full of welcome for sinners, full of invitation to repent and believe the good news. We love that about you, Lord. We're grateful. In Jesus' name.